Welcome. My name is Mike Kinman. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the rector here uh, at All Saints Church. It is great to have you all here here. It is great to hear here. It is great to have all of you who are joining us uh, online. Um, I almost hesitate to say this, but it is today is the two-year anniversary of the last normal Sunday here at All Saints Church uh, before we moved online the first time. Um, And so which means is we're about to start year three of COVID life. Um, And it has been and continues to be a challenge. It is a challenge that is unevenly distributed and different folks with different social locations have had different experiences of it. And it has been a challenge for everyone and it has had trauma uh, for everyone. And um, as we both come back together in person, recognizing that there are still many of you um, who are joining us uh, online, and many of you who have joined this church online from places literally all over the world. Um, We wanted to start having a conversation about what is this new world we're moving into, um, and realizing that we're taking, we're carrying a whole bunch of stuff from the last two years, stuff that touches other stuff in our lives from time even before in family systems things. so we wanted to talk uh, about that and say, well, what can we do as a community? And, and are there things that we're noticing um, that you might think, wow, that doesn't have anything to do with COVID, but we're realizing that, uh, that it does. Um, and do sort of a, a particular focus on children, youth, and families, but not restricted to that because you know, we're all connected. And so we're really thrilled to have just three outstanding panelists as expert resources for this conversation. Uh, the first is Dr. Uh, Kristen Choi. Uh, Dr. Choi is a child, adolescent, psychiatric nurse, and health services researcher. She studies health services and policy approaches to behavioral health, trauma, and violence among children. Her current research projects include studies on the autism spectrum disorder, adverse childhood experiences, the impact of trauma and violence on nurses, and health system factors associated with firearm uh, violence. Uh, She maintains, she's both a clinician and a scientist. She's an associate director of nursing at the UCLA National Clinician Scholars Program and an associate professor at uh, UCLA. As both a clinician and scientist, Dr. Choi maintains a clinical practice as a registered nurse at a community psychiatric hospital in downtown LA. She addresses child behavioral health from individual family system and policy levels in her research and is committed to a creative action-oriented program of research that will improve the health of vulnerable children and communities. So welcome, Dr. Choi. Good to have you here. Um, Many of you know Dr. Burnell Anderson, originally from Houston, Texas, a licensed clinical psychologist in the greater LA area. She's a clinical associate professor of psychiatry and the behavioral sciences at the Keck School of Medicine at USC and has a private psychotherapy practice in, here in Pasadena. Her professional interests and experience include psychoanalytic psychotherapy, mindfulness, psychological impact of chronic medical disease, psychotherapy with African descended persons, spiritual issues in psychotherapy, grief and loss, body I- I- image issues, depression, stress and anxiety, individual couples and group psychotherapy, crisis intervention and consultation. She is passionate about sharing her expertise in workshop presentations, especially on topics addressing diversity, privilege, oppression, and professional identity development. Great to have you here, Uh, Dr. Anderson, yes. And then you may know the Reverend Dr. Sally Howard. Um, Sally is a clinical psychologist, a contemporary psychoanalyst, and an Episcopal priest. She has specialized training in human development, trauma, and attachment systems. When practicing, Sally has worked with children, families, and adults here at All Saints Church. She is an associate rector, she works with our beloved community circle. She convenes our administration circle. She has been working with Dr. Nicole Gatto on all of our common sense risk reduction protocols for uh, COVID during this pandemic and a list of other things that are just way too numerous to mention. Sally, thank you as always for being here. So yeah. And so I I really just wanna start off and I'm gonna sit down and join you. and, and really say, uh, and maybe we sort of start with you. Uh, can we just call you Kristen? Okay. Um, what have you seen on the ground in clinical care? How have you seen people struggling with the pandemic and, and other traumas in the world? And then we can all just sort of like, all of you sort of talk about what is it that you've been seeing? Uh, 
relationships. Technology. Yes, yes, thank, thank you so much. Um, so first, uh, I just want to say thank you all so much for having me here today and uh, inviting me to, to be a part of this discussion. So um, as Mike said, I uh, practice as a psychiatric nurse in, in LA in one of the safety net hospitals where we take care of some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. Um, on the adult side, almost all of the patients that we take care of are people who are homeless. And on the child side, uh, we take care of a lot of kids that, um, again, are coming from some of our most marginalized communities. Uh, we take a lot of kids who are undocumented, uh, who might be refugees, as well as a lot of kids who are coming from some of the ICE detention centers and um, dealing with a lot of trauma in their lives, of course. Um, and I think during COVID, uh, to be honest, I think COVID has really brought light to a lot of pain uh, that was happening in, in individual people, but also in our systems of mental health care more broadly. Uh, there, um, of course, is a lot of shortage of mental health care providers and services, especially for people like the kind that I see in practice. And um, during COVID, I think a lot of that, uh, that, that trauma really just became exacerbated as people found themselves alone, isolated, and dealing with a lot of new stressors that weren't a part of their lives before. One of the things that I saw um, quite a bit was kids who were dealing with a lot of violence at home, uh, whether that was seeing domestic violence, uh, abuse, things that they may have been a bit shielded from when they were at school, but that during COVID they were really forced back home into environments that were uh, violent and dangerous and that that really took a toll on their mental health. Uh, another thing that I saw was a lot of kids who uh, may have identified as LGBTQ, who perhaps were not out to their parents or hadn't really um, let their parents into that part of themselves because they were worried about not being accepted. And again, that was another situation where we saw a lot of kids uh, struggling when they were, again, forced to be at home and not able to, to be themselves fully. Um, and uh, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention is that during COVID, the hospital where I work started a new program where we uh, are caring for kids experiencing mental health problems who are at the ICE detention centers. Um, and that has been a really uh, difficult and, and painful group to take care of. Uh, there are a lot of kids who are coming from extremely traumatic backgrounds uh, and who have really, since they've come to the US, experienced a lot of trauma in those detention facilities. And um, you know, uh, in some ways, as a nurse, I think that I see people when they're in a moment of crisis, and um, unfortunately, we can uh, help address that immediate crisis, but the work that we do in hospitals, at least in mental health, often can't solve the root causes of some of the issues that we're seeing, and there's a lot more long-term work that, that has to happen for people. And so um, the last thing I'll just mention is that I think that knowing that my role is very short-term when I see these kids and families, um, I think, again, COVID has brought light to a lot of the ways that our systems of care for people who are vulnerable are deficient and how there's a lot of gaps. And, um, you know, that's something that I certainly hope we'll see change going forward. Yeah. Um, Brunel, first of all, before uh, you go, I want to just tell everyone we're going to be, uh, you can text your questions and we're going to have time for questions from everyone here. You can text your questions into 910-TEXT-ASC. 910-839-8272. That's 910-839-8272. No? That's, yeah, that's, thank you, Kristen, in terms of what you shared. It um, connected for me, I have a new role at USC, actually. The bio is a, just a slightly dated, um, as of December 1st, I'm now a professor within the Marriage and Family Therapy Program. And so part of what we teach our master's level students is how to work with populations who are on the margin, whether it's those who've been affected by ICE, those who are undocumented, those um, persons who are affected by racial injustice. And so part of my work as a clinical psychologist, but also a professor is in my private practice, I have a consulting arm that I've called Beloved Blackness. And within that, over the pandemic, what I have found is reaching out to schools, educators, as well as community organizations, and hospitals and um, community mental health centers to help the leaders learn how to manage the trauma and the um, impact of the trauma on those who are providing the care. 
And so I've been one of the persons saying, hey, you have to take care of your team before you can take care of the students. You have to take care of those clinicians before they can take care of their clients or their patients. And so that's been really critical for me in terms of helping them to learn skills for themselves because they're so accustomed in the role of being the one saying, let's go out there and serve, let's help. And so they say, wait, we have to help the helper. We have to help you have a fuller cup in order for you to be able to go out there and be able to nourish and be there and be on the front lines. And connected to that, there's a quote by Stephen Porges where he says, trauma is a chronic disruption of connectedness. And so what I've attempted to do in each of those different arenas is to help the um, persons identify where is there a disconnectedness? Where is that disruption of connectedness taking place within the system, within the person, within the educational environment, in order to tend to that particular disconnection, in order to be able to bring some sense of resilience within those particular systems. Um, thanks so much. Uh, you know, I think in this context, in our church context, but, you know, certainly beyond our church context, you know, there is an increase in anxiety and depression um, and loneliness, um, you know, during the COVID uh, pandemic. And, uh, you know, along the lines of connection, I wanted to add that, you know, part of what is so difficult about the pandemic um, is that our very center, you know, of being um, needs connection, right? And proximity to people that love us and that we love, especially when we're in dangerous circumstances. That's just a foundational aspect to, you know, human beings. And so in this situation where we want to need proximity, but proximity itself is a danger, is just, you know, very, very difficult and traumatizing. And I wanted to mention, you know, just in terms of parents and families, I think we add into that, you know, a sense of being overwhelmed. Um, you know, all of us optimally develop, you know, rhythms of life with enough social connection, enough quiet, you know, the things that help us in our routines feel at home and at peace in the world. And of course, babies and kids do that also, right? And um, so with families, you know, parents, right, who are trying or have been trying or needing to homeschool, try to keep, you know, kids engaged in something that is so developmentally, you know, inappropriate for kids. Um, and they're dysregulated, their kids are dysregulated. And so, you know, it's been very stressful on families and couples and kids. Um, you know, as parents, we, we, you know, kids need a wider circle than us to begin with, right? We, we can't give our kids everything they need. And so it, it, it has made it, um, I think, very challenging. And, you know, I hear many, many parents uh, feeling at different points, overwhelmed, and like they can't, they don't even know where they're going to find the energy to take the step, the next step. And their kids are also really upset. And so um, that's a very challenging time. Wanted, I, I, yeah, go, go, jump in. Could you read my eyes? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One piece that I was thinking about that's been obviously an undercurrent throughout the entire pandemic is the impact of the societal unrest after George Floyd's murder. So a significant part of the work that I also have been doing has been education around racialized trauma training. And so allowing, whether it's mental health clinicians or educators, to know how to incorporate conversations and dialogues with those in which they are there to serve to be able to talk about the impact of whether it's kids now being able to have access to videos and watching the trauma of seeing someone actually be murdered before their eyes and the fears that now teachers or educators and mental health clinicians are now having to address in a more direct way. 
as well as secondary traumatization in terms of listening to the stories, those clinicians who are listening to the stories, but also are witnessing and watching those videos. And so that's, I think, an important key piece that we've had to integrate throughout the pandemic as well. So look, one of the things when we were talking earlier this week that I forget, I think maybe, Brunel, it was you that brought it up, is this idea of a window of tolerance that we all have sort of this window where we can tolerate a certain amount of distress. Um, and it is different for each person. And, and then what happens when we sort of, can you talk a little about that? Yeah, so that's a concept that Dan Siegel, Dr. Dan Siegel is a psychiatrist at UCLA has where we all have, I'm just gonna use my hands, like if you think of the window of tolerance being within where this hand is and this hand is, we all have a certain amount of stress that we all can, um, can be able to manage or tolerate. And when we go outside of our window of tolerance, we either have, either have a hyper-aroused response or a hypo-aroused response. So if you're going above your window of tolerance, whatever that particular stressor or chronic stressors are, above you may start to feel more anxious, you may start to feel more agitated, may have difficulty being able to sleep. And if you go, are hypo-aroused beneath the window of tolerance, more kind of apathy, numbness, depression, but also you may have an inability to say no to people. So you may find yourself saying yes to a lot of different things. And so the idea is that we can in, in, involve ourselves with strategies and have tools to expand the window of tolerance. And persons from marginalized communities actually have lower windows of tolerance. And so we have to take responsibility to ensure to give tools and strategies. And that's been part of what I've done in, some, in different trainings throughout the pandemic, is how do you equip, equip people to have strategies to help broaden the window of tolerance? And one of those is just creating safe spaces, that warm, co regulating persons to interact with who are safe, compassionate, inviting you to be able to tell your story, ex express what you're experiencing, whatever the, the like what uh, Reverend Sally was talking about in terms of challenges as a parent, your capacity to hold that co-regulates the other person's nervous system. So then that helps to expand the window of tolerance. And um, Brunel, I, I would just add to that, I really like the window of tolerance. I find it to be a really helpful tool that I use a lot when I'm talking to kids, especially about how to manage strong feelings they're having. And one of the things that I really appreciate, um, an analogy that Dan Siegel uses to talk about the window of tolerance is kind of the metaphor of, of a river. And if you think of yourself in a boat floating down a river, on one side you have the bank of hyperarousal, and on another side you have the bank of hypoarousal. And in our lives, we have to travel down this river and, and stay the course and not get thrown off course into these side banks. And um, in the analogy, of course, your river, river might be wide or it might be narrow, but we also sometimes might have things that come up in our path. There might be a rock in the path or, or a shipwreck or a time when the window narrows because of circumstances and it becomes much more likely that you're gonna be thrown off course into one of those banks. And I think that, um, I absolutely agree, I think you, you of course can expand your window of tolerance but also, I think that's been especially hard during COVID because we do have all of these external blocks that are making it harder for us to stay that course and stay in a place where we can regulate our emotions. And I think all of us, uh, in various ways, have had um, rocks come up in our path that, that make it really, really challenging um, to stay in that place where we're centered and calm and, and able to tolerate what we're feeling. So um, I've seen it be challenging for people, I'm sure you both have too, that, that it's especially hard right now to, to do that work of staying centered in the window of tolerance. There we go. Uh, just a reminder, you can text your questions in at 910-TEXT-ASC, 910-839-8272. One of the things that's happened in this pandemic is I've so often felt less like a priest and more like a radio talk show host. Um, and we've all had to sort of shift things. One of, um, to sort of get really specific, I mean, one of the things that all of you mentioned is anxiety uh, and fear. I was having a conversation with one of our All Saints parents yesterday who was talking about uh, sort of the change now where kids are now able to take their masks off and where like, like my response to that would be, wow, that's great, that's freeing, that's wonderful. But their child's response was really fear uh, because for the last two years, they've been taught, you know, oh no, you gotta keep your mask on, other people do, that's how you stay safe. Um, and then all of a sudden, especially for younger kids who really haven't even had an experience of school without masks, um, how as parents and families as a church, you, you say using that as an example, um, how do we help kids through this kind of fear of transition into a new stage 
Um, and then also realizing, well, there may be a time that comes in the future where you gotta put that mask back on. I mean, what do we do with this? Go ahead. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah, it is, you know, it is, uh, I think, really challenging that way. And I think, you know, I think as parents, you know, giving as best you can, you know, explanations that kids can use about it and that it takes time. I mean, we've learned not only masking, but a lot of other things about distancing that, you know, it was hard to get used to in the beginning, but we've been doing it now, and that's also kind of a brain pattern now, the more familiar. But I think, um, I think you know, allowing kids, you know, the opportunity to kind of take their time with it until they feel comfortable. You know, it isn't required that you unmask, right? You can. And so I think, you know, sometimes also starting in places that feel safe, you know, um, maybe that don't have as much face-to-face -face or close contact, um, kind of um, desensitizing children in a sense to that anxiety that they can do this and, and be safe and, and take their own steps towards um, a complete unmasking. Uh, and most kids, I think, will get to that. And I think the other piece is context. So if you have kids, um, particularly who may live with family members who are elderly, you have um, kids who have seen family members die or be significantly incapacitated by COVID, you wanna respect and honor their process in terms of what it would mean to remove a mask now. Because part of the recommendation, like you're just saying is, yes, you can remove them now, it's not required, but it's still strongly recommended by the C CDC. And what does that mean in terms of who are still the vulnerable population and to not have the expectation be for it to be even across children, even across adolescents, or even, even across adults, right? And so one of the things that we plan on doing even, because um, USC has also lifted it, and so tomorrow will be the first day. So one of the things that we plan on doing as a faculty is just having time to process with students. How do they feel? What creates safety for them in the classroom? Do they want to sit next to someone who is masked? Are they okay sitting adjacent to someone who is not masked and they are masked? And so to be able to create an environment where they actually can share what does it feel like to actually have this new thing happen, but within the context of all of the relational and emotional experiences that they had over these past two years. Yeah, I would totally agree with those suggestions. I think um, giving kids time and space to transition out of something that we've all gotten really used to is really important. I, I also think for kids that might have um, a more serious level of anxiety around unmasking or around changes, I think that parents um, have a really big role to play in teaching kids how to be flexible and not rigid in, in their thinking and how to um, kind of uh, learn to understand uh, something that's complex, which might be that there are some places where we wear masks and somewhere it's okay not to, or some uh, sometimes in the pandemic when things have been really serious and, and this has been something we have to do, the context is changing and helping kids to work through those things. Um, I think that parents uh, play a big, really role, a really big role in uh, modeling that flexibility and in, in thinking. Um, I also think that, especially for kids who are older, um, I think that it's easy for kids to have very black and white thinking and, and a lot of um, sort of distorted patterns of thinking around the pandemic, whether it's catastrophizing or black and white thinking or, or you know, thinking that if I take my mask off, you know, I'm, I'm going to die and just really um, thinking of it in very black and white ways. And I think that we can also um, do, do some work just to help put some nuance there for kids and help them see that uh, again, things in the pandemic are changing all the time, and um, it's it's more nuanced than than it was at this time a few years ago. And and we know more than we did then. Uh, and again, kind of just easing them into um, a more flexible way of thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, over the last several months, I've had just a number of conversations that have just been like left my mouth open, which of course you can't see because I have my mask on. Um, but of just like, oh my gosh, I never thought of that as a consequence of the pandemic. And I'll give sort of two brief examples. I was talking with uh, a local art teacher at an elementary school, um, and he was saying that um, he literally had young kids falling out of their chairs in the classroom because they didn't have the core strength to sit up for long periods of time because they've spent the last two years leaning forward on a table looking at a computer. And he, like, they would literally just fall out of their chairs. 
Um, and then they found out other teachers were having the same issue, and so they had to sort of say, what do we deal with this? And then I was on the sort of the older end of the spectrum. I was talking to someone who works at a local university with incoming students, and the students were coming on campus for orientation, and they were just sort of like going nuts with like partying and drug use and different things like that. And part of what they recognized is there's a whole level of social emotional development that happens your last two years of high school where you're experimenting and pushing different envelopes and trying different things. And of course, depending on your family situation, you have different levels of security in doing that. Uh, but you've at least had an opportunity to sort of try some things and get to know them. And now you have these young people who are at college for the first time, they have this whole freedom which they may never have had before, but they haven't had that experience or hopefully that safe place to try this. And so universities are like, oh my gosh, you know, these, you know we've got to do a whole bunch of other things. Are there other things that you are seeing that might, that like you might not think, oh, that's like initially think of something that, oh yeah, that's gonna happen because of a pandemic. Are there other sort of things that you're seeing? Hmm. You know, I think I'm still seeing and hearing a lot from people, although I don't know that this is an unexpected thing, but, you know, still, um, you know, difficulties with concentration sometimes. Um, um, and a lot of people, you know, feeling very happy, you know, to be back together or to have opportunities to be unmasked but also finding it um, surprisingly overwhelming. Um, and again, I don't know if that's unexpected since we have been in this situation, but um, it's like our bodies and brains, you know, have to relearn what it means to be unmasked <laughs> and all together. And, um, and so I think it, it, it feels surprising to people uh, sometimes. I, I think, I've, I mean, there's a number of things I can think of, but, I, you know, I think one of the biggest ones is seeing, um, this is really something that accelerated perhaps a trend that was already there, but a lot of kids who just live so much of their lives uh, digitally in a way that is hard for me to um, understand or imagine, but I, I've seen kids that have whole friendships, relationships, like very, very well-developed lives that they live entirely virtually. and. Um, that's, that's a big surprise uh, to me, and I think that for some kids it will be um, a transition to, to kind of going back to, to being in person and thinking about what those relationships look like in the real world. I will say, you know, there have been um, certainly negative effects of these sort of missed developmental milestones and, and missed um, opportunities and things that normally happen in the lives of kids, but I think there are also some things that have been positive. One example that I've seen um, at, where I teach at UCLA is that a lot of students with disabilities have found that COVID has been extraordinarily um, helpful and freeing for them to be able to do their classes online, uh, to not have the pressure of having to come in person and uh, navigate uh, an environment that often is pretty hostile to people with disabilities. Um, the option to participate and learn online has been extraordinarily liberating and has really transformed their education. So um, I think probably Sorry, I hope that wasn't me. Um, many, many things that, that, that were a problem, but um, I, I also thought of that when you were talking, Mike, that there have been some things I think that have been good and that I hope we can retain going forward uh, in, in terms of how we leverage technology and, and use it. The, the thought I had isn't related to children and families um, specifically, but just about us as people in terms of wearing masks and that we've missed so much of the nonverbals in terms of communicating with people, whether it's a smile and like, I know when I was doing Zoom for a couple of weeks when the semester started with my students, I'd go into the classroom and like, oh my goodness, who is that with the mask on? Like I could not recognize who the person was. And the other piece kind of connected to that is being like overly dependent on the names at the bottom. <laughs> That's been a challenge for me to get back in the classroom. It's like, oh my goodness, tell me your name one more time because I've been accustomed to seeing the names at the bottom of Zoom. And so that, and typically I'd be able to remember a name pretty easily, you know, we were in person and so, um, I think the nonverbal piece really stands out for me. One, just being someone who enjoys and appreciates using my nonverbals to communicate to people, um, having that loss and now be able to reclaim it in some ways and in, in places that feel safe. Yeah, Kristen, I was um, gonna say also I think that benefit of 
um, moving some things online, you know, for our child and youth program has also, um, you know, fostered even greater connections. And, you know, I wish, I wish one of them were here, but they're off working with the youth, right? Um, but, it, you know, platforms that I don't know, and I can't repeat to you, but um, that has really endured. And so even when we've gone back to in-person, you know, they're, they're, these connections online have continued and we've been able to, you know, to have adults present in those and kind of monitoring those. But um, there, there really are some positive things that have come out of COVID. Well, one other that I'll mention is specifically around mental health. I've seen um, a lot of people that have really liked the option to use texting or phone calls or um, video conferencing for, for mental health, um, that it, mental health uh, still does have a lot of stigma around it. And for people that maybe have never been to see a therapist or a psychiatrist, that can feel kind of intense. Um, but being able to text someone or call someone or maybe talk to someone from the comfort of your own home, I have seen really lower the barrier to entry for a lot of people and I think make um, mental health care just less scary and less intense in a way that, that has been really beneficial. So that's been another one that's been good to see that I do hope will stick around. When you were talking about the, the masks piece, it reminded me of you know, my whole experience of Zoom and also like doing online worship, um, but particularly Zoom, where you're like are looking at someone's face, um, is, is that it is significantly more tiring than being in person. And, and I forget who I was talking to about this, and they said, uh, and they talked like what you just said, we're used to picking up all sorts of information from being in the room with people. And, and our brains are naturally searching for that information. And, and he said, it's like when you've got your phone on Wi-Fi and there's no Wi-Fi around, it's continually searching for a signal and it drains your battery. Um, and, and so, like we've gotten to where we're just like continuing to, and even with in person with masks on, our brains are continuing to try to find information that it's getting blocked from being. Yeah. And, and in addition to all the other trauma, that's something that is just like, that just makes us tired. Yeah. Um, so uh, I got a question that was just texted in. Um, how do we provide psychological care for traumatized kids in foster and institutional care in the current environment where we are focused mainly on pandemic ourselves and foreign war of aggression? Same for people in institutional care, people experiencing homelessness. I think about our own safe haven program, uh, people who are incarcerated. How do we do that? Uh, there's a lot of parts to it, I think. It's, it's a big question, but a, a really good one. Um, you know, I, I think there's not um, a super easy silver bullet answer, unfortunately, but there are a couple things that um, I've observed in, in the process of working as a nurse with some of these patients that I think I would prioritize. So um, I think one is uh, just tackling some of the bigger picture um, societal uh, policy issues or societal problems that drive some of these issues. So when I think about things like homelessness or kids who have experienced abuse and neglect or kids who I see dealing with uh, immigration trauma, a lot of those things are driven by the policies that we have and, and by um, the context that we force people to live in. And so I think a lot about how we can make change at that level. Uh, because I uh, personally work with a lot of people who are homeless and dealing with serious mental illness here in LA, one of the things things I think about a lot is how we can have uh, more options for housing for people where they can be supported with substance use treatment and mental health care. And that's something that, of course, has been very difficult to do in our communities, but something that I would love to see happen and I think is a really high priority. Um, beyond that, uh, as everyone here knows, unfortunately, we live and have lived for a very long time with quite a serious shortage of mental health care providers. Uh, we have shortages of psychiatrists, child psychiatrists, nurses, therapists, and a lot of people, especially people who might live in rural areas, live in these mental health care deserts where there is functionally no system of care for them if they, if they wanted to get help. And when we don't have those options for community-based care and preventive mental health care, uh, what happens is that all that's available to people is help when they're having a crisis. But there's no way to prevent those crises from happening or help people recover after they've had a crisis. So I'd also love to see more um, investment in kind of building up that community-based mental health care 
in incentivizing more people to come and work in mental health and specifically to go to the underserved areas where, where we know that um, people are, are really struggling. I um, read an article in the LA Times a couple weeks ago that has really stuck with me. Uh, one of the reporters did an analysis of mental health care here in LA and they compared the cities of Santa Monica and Compton. Uh, which are about the same size. And what they found was that in Santa Monica, there are about 360 practicing psychologists. And in Compton, which is the same size, there were five. Wow. And so hearing about those disparities is, is very troubling to me. And, and I really think when we think about um, building up that mental health workforce, it's not just about getting more people to become therapists or psychiatrists, but thinking about how do we incentivize people to go to those areas where help is really needed. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that, but I think it's, uh, not just kind of building up that workforce for everyone, but really targeting the places where help is needed the most. Yes, I, um, I would add just in our experience here, maybe a personal, some personal stories, but with Safe Haven, in which we do have 12 individuals who are unhoused, who live or sleep on campus, there is a, a high incidence of uh, substance abuse and mental illness, and we work closely, you know, with the Hope team, the the Pasadena Police uh, Special Unit for people who are unhoused. And you know, there have been at least three occasions um, when you know we've waited. I've waited, you know, for the Hope team because the Hope team is, you know, way understaffed, right? And um, with someone who's not da a danger to others, but is gravely disabled, can't, uh, thought disorders, you know, um, psychotic, um, frightening to think of this person trying to navigate anything during the day in that kind of vulnerable state. And the solution, the only solution that um, the HOPE team has been able to offer is to set up a situation where they are resisting arrest so they can be taken to Twin Towers. And Twin Towers is the largest psychiatric, it's, it's not a psychiatric hospital, but it's a warehouse in, in the United States. And that's what we have to offer people who are unhoused uh, in this area. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what can we do? Are there things that we can sort of build up our toolkits as a church, as families, um, what do we do to help each other through some of the stuff that we've been talking about? Okay. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> um, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the acronym, a tool that um, I developed a couple of years ago called the Beloved Blackness Antidote to the Stress of the Trauma of the Pandemic, using the term hugs. And I intentionally used the, the word hugs because we were unable to hug one another. And so the H is for honesty, the U is for uplift, the G is for grieving, the S is for soothing. And within that, tr working to try to address the many different areas in which our lives are being impacted by the pandemic and societal unrest related to being, whether it's part of a community of a marginalized um, population, or just the amount of trauma that we've had to endure in terms of um, racist and, um, and overtly violent behaviors towards um, people of African descent. And so um, with the age, creating conversations like this where we're honest with one another, like the honesty is critical because first you have to be honest with yourself about how has this trauma impacted me? Honest about how has it impacted my body? How's it, how has it impacted my just basic day-to-day um, -day activities? You know, just daily living. Am I waking up later than I usually wake up? Am I sleeping a little bit less? Am I drinking a little bit more? What are those things in terms of being honest around how has this pandemic impacted me? How has it impacted my family? Being honest about that. 
the uplift is around community, that we get uplifted when we are with one another, that we are not created to live in isolation. And so to be able to be intentional and creative around creating environments of uplift, whether it's like thinking about oh, my Facebook feed is coming up from last Lent, the dance parties that we did. And so, you know, being creative even within the limitations, you know, and so now being creative in terms of having more opportunities to be able to share with one another, break bread with one another, and to say, hey, how are you doing, bro? how you doing sis how you doing um, fam how you doing and to be able to really be there and of support to one another and the G is for grieving and we need to be able to make space for the loss right we've had so many losses over these last few years and continue to experience the losses and sometimes even the loss is something like now I have to go back as a black identified person into a predominantly white institution to have questions asked of me about things I don't really want to talk about in that space right and the safety of being at home where it's like hey i can just call my girlfriend up and talk about things that are happening but now i have to go into a space where i've been protected because i've been on zoom meetings and i cannot have to say anything because it's a different experience being online versus being in the room and so talking about and grieving those losses and the soothing piece is around being able to find ways to self-soothe kind of connected to some of the window of tolerance um, strategies but our nervous systems need we need to have outlets and trauma affects our bodies and so it could be something as simple as making sure that you're taking a walk, engaging in a yoga practice, just doing some stretching, ways in which you move your body and you soothe yourself in order to be able to have your body say, oh, there's a cue of safety there, I'm okay. Because when we get unregulated, it feels as if the world is a dangerous place. So we have to create cues of safety to counter there's so many cues of danger that we're having to contend with. And there are a couple of ideas I have around that for children and families, but I don't have to share that now. I can share it later if you want go, me to. Go ahead. Okay. So I brought, I'll share. So this is like, you can, you can get whatever plastic container or ornament that you want to use, but if you're working with your kids at home and you want to do something, you can create a grief jar, okay? And so you can get different color sheets of paper that you put in, each color could represent a different emotion. And what you're wanting to help your child do is identify what are the losses that they have endured. They can even, if it's a particular person, it could be a pet, it could be a particular thing that they've lost. And, or as a family, you create it together. And you want to create it as a way of having a, a, something that comes comforts them and soothes them, but also helps them to process the loss. So they can write on the sheet of paper certain memories of that particular thing or that particular object or that particular event, and then go through it and you can, they can decorate it, you know? And so kids like to be crafty, especially younger ones, and so they can put stickers on it, they can decorate it with markers or crayons. However, it's about them creating a space that says, hey, I'm gonna honor my grief. Another idea is, I just brought some balloons because we have masks, we can't actually do it. If we were like doing this form together, I'd give all four of us a balloon to do. But this is a strategy related to soothe because one of the ways that we can really soothe ourselves is connecting to the breath. And so contemplative practices like mindfulness meditation, Dr. Harrell's soulfulness meditation practices can be really helpful. And with the balloon, what you can do is teach children and family members how to be able to do diaphragmatic breathing or even settling breaths. And so with settling breaths, you want your exhalation to be a little bit longer than your inhalation. And so I did this activity um, last week with my students in, the child and fam in our child and adolescent um, psychotherapy course, and I had them literally practice so that they know, okay, this is a skill you can take in with your families and with your clients. And so you, you inhale a certain, like it could be four breaths or beats of inhale, and then you exhale into the balloon six. And so that's teaching them how to be able to do settling breaths. And then I had them tie the balloon and I said, okay, now get into your groups and I want you to keep all the balloons up, but you are not able to touch your own balloon. Whatever color your balloon is, someone else is responsible for keeping that balloon elevated. So as a family, you can do that, right? You can say, hey, this teaches us as a family that we're here for one another. You don't have to carry it alone by yourself because I got your balloon. And so then it turns into play and play is a really important way in terms of talking about soothing as an outlet, getting connected to our inner child, doing things that bring, gives us a sense of novelty or creativity, we need those as outlets as well. And so then this activity turns into not just teaching you how to be able to regulate your nervous system based on connecting to the breath, but also play, collaboration, being there and connecting this as a family. Yeah, those are great suggestions, Brunel, and I, I totally agree. I think that um, definitely a lot of this work starts with yourself. Um, it's very hard to um, help others work through their trauma and stress if you're operating from a place uh, where, where you are dealing with your own trauma and stress. And 
uh, it's really difficult to give when you're running on empty yourself. So I really do think it starts um, with, with ourselves and um, figuring out how to get to a place where we are full enough to be able to give to others. And, and again, you, you had some really wonderful suggestions. The only other thing I was gonna say is that I also think when it comes to sort of tackling some of the bigger drivers of, of the pain that we're seeing in communities, I think it's also really important that we think about um, our own role in this and how we as a community can be supportive of the things that are actually gonna count for people who are marginalized. During COVID, I, um, I live on the west side of LA, I don't live in Pasadena, but I've spent a lot of time walking around my neighborhood and talking to my neighbors more than I ever had in the past. And you know, when I tell people I, I'm a nurse, I take care of people who are homeless, they say, that's great, I, that's so important. We just well, really, really wanna see homelessness taken care of, it's amazing you do that. But I'm amazed by how many people I talk to who will say that in one breath, and then in the next breath, they will fight tooth and nail to make sure that the zoning of their house never changes and that nothing ever changes in our neighborhood. And um, I, I think that we have to think really carefully about how our actions actually line up with our values and how we as people, families, communities um, might need to think about sacrifices if we really care about this and really care about seeing that change. So um, that, that's just one thing I, I would point to, is, is thinking about how it affects us. And it was great to, great to hear that you, you all have um, some programs here for homelessness and um, you know, really are, are doing that actual work of thinking about how can we do something that's actually gonna count, not just say that we have these values, but then live our lives as though um, th those values don't, don't actually, we, we don't, not actually living out the values in our actions, I guess. Yeah, you know, I would just uh, wanna Echo, really, also that, you know, exercise, walking, trying to get your heart rate up. Um, it's the only known thing to combat cortisol in the brain. Is is enough to make it hard to sing, whatever that is, um, uh, is helpful. But also, you know, th this has been said a lot, but if there's one thing that um, the pandemic uh, broke through some is that unless all of us are safe, none of us are safe, right? That we are all connected. And that is true um, also in a psychological way. That if there are members of our community that are targeted by violence and racism and lack of resources, um, it impacts us all. It's damage to us all. And we are truly, we can't psychologically be healthy. Can't be holy either. Um, but we can't be healthy fully unless every person has what they need. That is just the fact. And whether we're aware of it or deny it, or it is, it is a real fact that all of those things injure all of us, right? We all have a cost. We have some time for some questions uh, from here. Um, Marcia. Thank you. Well, appreciate all of the good um, expertise and, and comments. And I was particularly struck, Nicole, when you're talking about society in general. Um, Nicole, I mean, I think oh, okay. Kristen. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Um, Kristen, um, talking about society generally because, and the, the part that all of us need to look inside ourselves and see how can we help. Um, to that end, I was, Pat and I were very impressed with the campaign that the Martin Luther King Mental Health Center, the hospital and, and health center put on. Brian Stevenson was behind that in really encouraging support and when you talked about the difference between Santa Monica and Compton, that, that is one that comes very much to home. So, uh, you know, that's something that we were very compelled and, and were supporting, are supporting, and it, because it goes to the broader community. It's not just where we are right now, but it's all of us and how we need to think of us as a community outside of just our own little neighborhood. So I just wanted to make that comment about the Martin Luther King Center and what that has meant and how that feeds the larger community. 
Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And, and I think that's a great example of, of exactly kind of what I was talking about, of really taking the actual actions or supporting the actions that are going to make a difference, um, more so than just saying the words. So real quick, I've got one in text, and we've got a couple other questions. Uh, this person texts in, I know for sure my social skills have diminished in the past two years. I'm not the only one, right? right. You're not the only right. one. <laughs> uh, also, my capacity for conversation and connection has decreased, even though I'm craving it. Any thoughts on when those types of things will return to normal, or is this just my life? Oh, no, it's not your life. Just think like bite sizes, you know, that incrementally, the more that you engage in the world, slowly over time, it's like waking up some muscles that have been dormant. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well said. You know, the brain is, in a way, like a muscle. It's not a muscle, but... <laughs> It does, um, it strengthens, and when those patterns have been there that are, you know, those social patterns that it used to come easy to us, they will, they will come back. Yeah, I'll also just say that, um, you know, a lot of the research on uh, trauma and how we heal from trauma has been really made clear that trauma uh, heals best in the context of relationships and of safe relationships, and even though um, I totally resonate with that, that some of those social uh, connections, it's, it's hard to be sort of ramping those back up in a way that we haven't seen now for a couple of years. Um, I do think it's important to, uh, to push ourselves to kind of grow back into that because I think it's also how we, we heal from a lot of the trauma that we're experiencing collectively. Thank you. Hi, I'm a Hi. teacher. And so um, what you've said about um, taking care of the caregivers yeah. and that whether or not that's fully recognized that the teachers, caregivers, et cetera, need to be healthy in order to bring health to the children. Yeah. So there's that piece, but there's also a, a question I have about whether the teachers should become the counselors. Have you found a trend in this realm where is it appropriate to ask the teacher to become a counselor? Is that a good thing in the long run? And then I have one more question. It's a, such a really important and interesting question because I feel like the roles are kind of um, merged in some ways, particularly right now. But also I feel like culturally, like if I think about back in the day, African-American teachers were always the counselors too. And so there wasn't this bifurcation of you're just there to teach a particular information. You're there to develop the whole person of this child. And so culturally, my response is like, oh, well, let's not put it in a box. But it doesn't mean that you have to develop skills of becoming a counselor as an educator. But what does that mean in terms of being a counselor? It means being concerned, being compassionate. So when I'm doing like trauma-informed classroom and um, school practices with two of the schools I've been working with, I say, how do you create part of what Kristen is just saying, a sense of this person feels you as a safe person, that you've done enough of your own, you've breathed, you've done all the practices I'm teaching you to offer to the students, you've done those so that when they experience you, they feel that you are present, they feel that you are safe as an instructor. That's fun fundamental as a counselor too, right? But you're taking and integrating the things that you want to offer to them, but first to yourself. So I wouldn't have the bifurcation be there in that particular kind of way because I feel like your person is what can help to regulate them. Uh, yeah, so the last thing. Um, do you have tools like surveys that you that I, I could access that would, a, a good survey to give to the teacher, a good survey mm -hmm. to give to the parent, to the, well, those two, the adults, that could get the conversation started about the trauma? Oh, that's good. I, it's not a survey, but I have a form. It's through the um, the STAR program, Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience. I'll post. I know at some point I posted it on our website, but I'll post it again so that you can have access to it. And it breaks down like five different categories of how we experience trauma, and then it has a subsequent page that then tells you what do you do within each of those five categories. So um, over here, and then got a couple. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my, my name is John, if that matters to anybody. <laughs> um, it's so much to unpack here, but one of the things that I kept hearing and wondering about is the different ways children to adults respond to whatever we call trauma, whatever is traumatic to them. And you know, I watched the Ukrainian situation with mothers in the mid in bunkers. They want their children to have a normal experience of being happy and play in the midst of all the bombing. And but coming forward, 
I think little children have very little history. So their recovery from their life of breakdowns, which a child's life is about breakdown and recovery consistently, is shorter term. So I think their recovery would be shorter. But as you get older, as I think about it, the longer the history I have, the more meaning I put into whatever the trauma is, the more I wonder about, the more... It, you know, I was, a, as a child, I was a very, you know, intense, focused on everything that was happening. I had to make rules for everything. So I was hyper aware. So trauma was different for me. So I'm just kind of wondering, how do you adjust, how do you focus all the different ways to, or how do you, I don't know, this is rambling, but the, um, I also get that when a child falls and, it, and lo he looks to around to the parent or the adults there to see how he should react to what's happened. So if you suddenly, as an adult, go, oh my God, then the child will cry. If you just say, if you stay normal, it doesn't. So how do we get the community to support appropriate reaction to whatever is going on? I guess that's where I, the real question I have. Thank you. Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> you not there's a lot of richness in that question, John. There is no, there is, you know. Yeah. And I think, you know, being able, it is true that, you know, uh, there there could probably be pros and cons to age, as meaning not being a child versus being an adult with trauma. But, you know, being able to narrate trauma with loving, safe, honest, caring others is helpful no matter what age, as long as you, you know, you've got words and you're able to talk. The impact of trauma on kids um, is, uh, is profound, actually. And depending, again, on context, resources, what the trauma is. Um, and, you know, trauma that happens prior to language is, you know, embodied trauma that is often quite impactful but and takes a lot of effort sometimes for people to locate it sometimes body body work and and language so it's it's a mixed thing but i think as a community you know um those being being that person for each other you know capacitates and heals i mean it does to tell our stories to tell to tell our whole stories um, and to be, you know, to be loved and held and um, just empathic, loving presence makes a huge difference in terms of people healing. Yeah. yeah. We're going to have to wrap up. I'm wondering, can, can the two of you stick around just for a few minutes if people might have other questions? Yeah. That would be great. And uh, just thank you all so much and thank the three of you. This has been really rich and really, really helpful. Um, just fantastic. Uh, next week, um, we're going to stay on this topic, but really talk about some new things that are happening here at All Saints Church. And what, Sally, do you want to say a little bit about that? Yes. That's better than me trying to figure out how to turn it on. Um, uh, yes, we will be uh, talking about the Community Care Alliance, and I know we've used a number of different names before, but, um, you know, one of the interesting things that came out of the pandemic is that, you know, we had parishioners that stepped up and said, we have got to connect. We've got to connect during this time. Um, and Christine Hartman and Thomas Diaz and Stacy Canelli have been central in that and as it developed it became also um, very connected with pastoral care and now those two um, things are working together in the beloved community circle of both congregational development and pastoral care um, and we're going to talk about that next week um, and are very excited about about that program so thank you and thank you all for being here and thank you all and we will see you either at 1130 service or next week. Thanks a lot. Bye.